Hello everyone, so today we're going to be making a very simple game. We're going to cover grid based movement, collision detection, kinematic bodies, static bodies and areas 2D, which are the basic nodes that you will need to make any 2D game with basic collisions. So I have this empty project here with only the assets which you can download from the descriptions. They are only four sprites and one font that I really like. It's pixelated, you can use it in many other places. Since you've already seen the end product at the beginning of the video, we have to set up the scene first. So if you notice, if I move the player here, it's very, very small in the screen. So we need to make it zoom. And also you see that the sprites are not pixelated as they should. So if I add them here on the screen, you see that they have the blurry borders. So we need to re-import them. To do that, you can select them here. And in the import tab, you can disable the filter flag and click on re-import. That way, all the pixels are going to be pixelated as we wanted. Another thing that we have to do is set up the scene size because let's try this out. Let's save it. Game. Okay. And everything is very tiny, so we need to zoom it in. To do that, we, let's go to the project settings. Now display here and window. Okay, size. When we're going to go with 180 for 720. And at the bottom here in mode, let's do 2D and keep. That way it will keep the aspect ratio when we stretch it. Now let's do the background. So here in rendering environment, here the background color. And the color that we are using for this is 71, 45 and 60. So the colors and the sprites are available here in this website. You can download them. It's, they are public domain, so you can use them for any kind of purpose. Yeah, I really recommend if you need something to prototype, you can go here and download them. So going back to the project, let's remove these nodes. Yes, we don't want them. And this one as well. Let's create a new one, which is only going to be a simple node 2D. And let's create the camera. The camera is going to be zooming in to the sprites. Let's add one again for reference. Okay, let's add the camera 2D. Okay, here in the anchor mode, which means where it's going to be set on here, the, the position. So if you go to transform, you see that it's there and we want it to be on the top corner right now. Let's change the anchor to fixed top left. That way we can set it to zero. And let's use the zoom. We want this to be like 0 0.25, which is like super big in comparison to the other. Like if you do it to half, like 0 0.5, it should be like half. And this is going to be like half of that. So we see the new frame of the window, which is this purple thing. And if we run this, Let's see, we need to first set it to current. The border goes wider, which means it's the camera that we're going to use. And we press play. And now the view is zoomed in and sprites are pixelated. So we have that already done. Another important thing is that we need to have everything on a grid. So let's enable here the grid. And as we see, it, it's not exactly as we want it to be because like we don't want the half steps. We only want like the bigger ones. Let's change the settings of the grid by going here and configure snap. So he here the steps should be 16. So we get the same size as the sprite. Now we need to do the same as we do with the camera, but with the sprite. So here on the offset, instead of having it on center, zero in X and Y is going to be the top left corner, same as with the camera. So now we have it and we can move the player in this kind of grid. Let's move the player to zero position. Let's create a new node, which is kinematic body. And put the sprite inside of the kinematic body. And we see a warning here because every 
collision node, every node that has physics or collisions, they need to have like a bounding box, like a hit box, where it will detect when something is colliding with it. Otherwise, Godot doesn't know exactly when the sprite ends or when it finishes. So we need to create one. To do so, let's add a new child. And they are all here in collision object 2D, physics bodies. These are the objects that need this kind of collision. And the collision shape is over here. So we create it. Now we get another warning, which is that we need a shape. In this case, since everything is going to be grid based, let's going to use a rectangle shape. And now we can set the transform. So the position is going to be eight and eight, and it's going to make it a bit smaller. Let's disable for a second the grid. So that way we make it a bit smaller than what we actually want. And there we have it. We have the kinematic body, the player splite, and the collision shape. Now with this, we can save it as a separate scene. And let's create a folder, which will be called scenes. And let's call this player. Let's rename it as player as well here. So if in the future we want to have two players at the same time, we can use the same scene and everything's okay. And now that we have the player, we can start with some code. So let's go to the editor. So now we open only this scene. Let's attach script to it inside of scenes, player.gd. And let's do the code right here. So to make this tutorial, I use KidScan code, grid-based movement code as a reference. So most of the explanations are here if you want to go deeper. For now, we're just going to get the basics of it and modify it so it fits better our project. But I really recommend it. There's links in the description as well as where you can download everything that I'm using. But let's continue now with the movement. So we want to capture every event that is happening, which means every key that is being pressed. So we yeah, handle inputs, which is a built-in function. And now we find the directions that the player wants to move. So that way we know that when we are going up, we're going to this vector, which is zero and Y. And when we move down or left and right, so that way we can always multiply the grid size, which is right now 16 by 16, by the direction that the player is moving. So if it's up, we multiply that on top and we know exactly where the player should be in the next grid movement. So let's define those now. Inputs. And we have the defaults here in the project, project settings, input map. Here we have UI up, down, left, and right, which are the ones that are binded to the arrow keys. And we're going to be using that. No need to create new ones. So UI up, vector2. And you can write it like so. So Godot already knows that you want the vector that is going up. Now UI down, and with the same, vector2 down. Okay, so now that we have the inputs, we can continue with this, which is for direction in inputs. And we want to check for the keys, which are these strings here. If the event, the event is the, the thing that Godot tell us that it's not being used, is action pressed and the direction. So we are checking the UI up, UI down, UI left, UI right. We will do the moving here. So move in the direction. And we are basically sending the value that we want to another function, which will handle the movement. So we keep those separated, the movement on one side and the input for the other. The move and we move the position equal to the input 
we select the direction that we're going, multiplied by 16, which is the size of the grid. So 16 is the size of the grid. The inputs will be checking for this and it will give us the direction that we're going and this should work. Let, let's try it out. I'm not entirely sure. Yes, it's moving on a grid. Okay. So now that we have the movement, we can continue doing other stuff and we're going to get back to this one. Just in case you want to change the grid later on or you have a different size of sprites, I really recommend to have a variable called grid size, which is, in this case is going to be 16. So instead of doing this number here and later on when you have a lot of code, you don't really know or you have to change it in many places, let's do it always with the grid size uh, variable. So, okay, so we have the grid size there. Now let's create some walls. To do that, let's do the same, but instead of creating a kinematic body, we're going to be creating a, a static body since it's a wall. Let's add a sprite. So, sprite and the texture, we can use the wall texture. Same, we change the offset and we create the collision. So here we have this story. Okay, so collision shape and we do new rectangular shape. Zoom in to be more precise. Eight and eight. We disable the grid. We make it smaller. Well, we have the wall and we enable the grid again. So now we have a wall. Let's see, let's put now, whenever we have a complex structure like this, I'm going to be saving it as a different scene. So that way we can reuse it many times. So let's save this branch as a scene and it's going to be wall. And let's rename it wall. So now let's move the wall here and let's, let's try. Okay, so we are moving on top of the wall. Why is that happening? Because we're not doing any collision checking. So since we're moving the position of something, we need to first check if that position is available or not. Can I move there? And if you cannot, don't allow it. So let's go ahead and code that. To check that, we're going to be using what is called a raycast. So we create a raycast, which is Imagine like a laser that you have and you can point to some directions. And if that laser touches something, it will tell you you're touching that thing. So instead of checking whenever you are already there, you can check with the laser. OK, I'm, that place is going to be busy because I can see the spot. So Raycast is basically doing that. Let's add it and you see this arrow which is represented in Godot as the thing that will be checking the direction. And we want that Raycast to be first smaller in this case 16 because we're not going to be checking very far away only the next block and we want to have this on the eight position and eight okay so that's coming from the center of the block that way we know where we are going and that's it for the setup of the node now let's go to the code let's do a variable on ready bar and let's call it ray to make it shorter because we're going to be using this a lot and that's the Raycast 2D. Now, before moving, we need to check if that direction is available or not. We check with the Raycast, Cast 2, which means change the direction to, and we want to get the same position that we're gonna be moving eventually, which is this one. Since we're gonna be using this a lot, let's create it as a variable and let's call it vector position. Okay, so we know that we're going to be checking that, the vector position, and also we're going to be moving to that vector position. After moving the raycast, sometimes since the physics engine like updates in a different pace, you need to make sure that the raycast is updated. So let's call the force raycast update, which will make sure that we know exactly that the raycast is looking where we want it to look. And we check this exclamation sign means that the opposite so if it's not 
colliding, we can move it. So to go back a bit, we first update the position. We make sure that the raycast is looking where we want. Now we check if that place is not colliding with anything, we can finally move. Let's try it out again. We should be moving and yeah, whenever I try to move in that direction, I cannot. So we have walls working. Let's try it out a little bit better. Let's create now here on the main scene, the wall. Let's, if you press control D or command D on Mac, you can duplicate this node so we can move it and we have different ones. So we can start creating our level like this. And let's try it out. If it works, should work, no problem. Yes. Okay. Can I go through the walls? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Now, since we're going to be making our levels like this, we're going to have a lot of instances of nodes that are going to get really messy. So let's create a new empty node. Let's call it walls and let's put all the walls inside of it. Okay. So that way we know that all the walls are there and we'll have to see them all the time. Now, another really important thing of this is the boxes that we're going to be pushing and the spots where they should be. So let's create those nodes. So one, the boxes, since are also going to be moving, we can use the same kinematic body uh, that we use for the player. So this is going to be the box. And for the spots, we're going to be using a different one, which is the area 2D. Areas are to detect that something is inside of a place or outside of it. And we don't want that to be the area doesn't have to collide with anything. It just needs to check that there's something on top of it or not. So let's create that area for a spot. And the box is already there. So we now need to create the sprites inside of them and the collisions. So we create a collision shape. Same as before. Rectangle transform 8, 8. Let's disable this, make it smaller. Okay. Enable it again. And instead of doing it again, we can just duplicate this one with control T and move it to the spot one. Okay. Now let's save them as separate scenes so we can reuse them or create a bunch of them. So this is the box one and this is the spot. So now we have one box and one spot around for our levels. So the basic goal of this game, as you might already know, is move the box to the spot. So whenever the box is there and all the boxes are in all the spots, you win the level and it continues. So let's do a very basic level to test that things are working and then we can create a, a more complex one. Oops. And okay, so it's going to be super simple box here, spot here. And okay, let's try it out. Let's see if we are colliding with things. Okay. We can move on top of that. That's it. But we cannot go into the box, which is the same logic that goes with the walls. The raycast is checking and it's seeing that there's a kinematic body there and it's colliding. So you cannot move there. Okay. Let's now make that the boxes are also able to move whenever you are pushing them. So if you want to move to that direction, it will check if the place that it will go, it's available. And if it is, it's going to move and your player is going to move as well. So it's going to require a little bit of the same code that we were using. Also, it's going to require a raycast. So let's create it right now. Same properties as before, 16. Position is going to be eight and eight and we have it there. Okay. So this is the raycast that we're going to be using and let's create a script. It's going to be called box. Okay. I'm just going to copy all this from the player and use it in the box as well. Now we're going to modify 
and remove the things that we don't want. We don't want it to move individually, so we can remove this. We also want to be checking and returning that to the player. So now let's do this, that if it can move, let's do return true. And if it cannot move, it will return false. That way, every time we call the move function, we're going to see if it is movable or not. And that's going to be useful because now, now here on the player, we need to check that if it is colliding with a box, if that box returns true to that movement, we can also move. Let's make the boxes now. Here in the node, you have a different tab, which is groups. Let's add them to a group, which is box. Now boxes are on a group and we know that all the boxes are inside of that group. So we don't have to check individually if the ob object that we are colliding is a box or not. We just have to check, is it on this group? Yes. Okay, so now we assume that we are colliding with something. So we need to check if that collider So now we have to check if that collider, so get collider, if collider is in group box, which is the group that we created. We make it move into the direction that we want, which is the same that we were trying to move. And since this is going to return true, if the object can move, we can now move ourselves. So position and vector position and that should be it so now what is happening is if we are colliding with something we get the collider we check if that collider is indeed a box if that's a box we can move in that direction the box and if that returns true it will move ourselves is if the box cannot move it will return false so we will not move okay let's save this and let's try it out we should be able to now move the box Yes. Okay, and I cannot move the box to a wall, so whenever we are there, we cannot move and we lose because there's no way to move it outside of it. Okay, if you have some issues here and the arrows are not working, the walls are colliding weirdly or anything like that, you can always here on the debug tab, press on visible collision shapes and you will see the game as you see it here. So you will see the direction that the Raycast is going and everything like that. That way you can check if there's something wrong in your setup, if the Raycast is not looking where it should be looking, or if the collisions are not properly set up. It's a very good way of debugging any issues that you might encounter. But let's now make that whenever I move this box into the spot, the game shows us like, a, okay, you've done it, like level clear. Let's create a dialog. So, and in control, pop up, window dialog, accept dialog. Let's create it. We have to set it to visible. And let's move it to the middle of the screen. Now it's looking like it's behind the elements, but it's going to be on top of them. And let's change it title to a smiley face and the dialogue is going to say level cleared. Okay. So we know that we cleared the level. Let's do this in lowercase. Okay. Um, so we want to show this dialogue whenever the box is inside the spot, but to do that, we need to check. And since we haven't done any code for that, Let's create the code now for the box for the spots. Let's go to spot scene and touch a script. This is going to be much, much simpler. Occupied. So are we occupied or not? This is the variable that we're going to check for checking that all the spots are occupied and we need to use these signals, which are body entered. We connect it to the script 
and the other signal is body exited. So if a body is inside of this, we do something and the same with the other one. In this case, we need to check if the body is in group box. So we don't want the player to be one of those elements that makes it be occupied or not. So occupied, it's true. And we can copy and paste now and set to false. So whenever a body entered, that means that there's a new body that goes in. It's true. And whenever a body goes out, we say it to false. So that means that it's not occupied yet. This of course works because everything is moving on a grid and there's no chance that two objects are going to be on the same place. So that's all you need for the spots. And now we need to create a script here for the game itself to check if the game is over. So let's create one script which is called game and here on the game script let's create a new function just to process the delta you can do the underscore because we're not going to use it and if you don't do it you, you will get a warning like you are not using this variable but it's okay we want to check all the spots so to do that let's first move the spots into a different node like we did with the walls so spots so we know that all the spots are going to be inside of this node same we're going to do with the boxes. Box. Okay. No, boxes. Okay. Now is everything tidy and we can also check them. So spots are going to be spots get children count. So this will return if there is only one spot, it will return one. If there are two spots, it will return two and so on and so on. Because we want to make sure that all the spots are occupied. So now that we have all the spots, we need to check if any, every spot is filled. So for in spots get children. This will give us an array with all the nodes that are inside of there. So if it is occupied, we can set the spots count that we had to minus one. So if we are checking everyone, if it's occupied and we subtract one, that means that when all the spots are occupied, we're going to get the zero as the number of spots. So if spots is equal to zero show the accept dialog which we do it like this with pop-up since process is something that is happening all the time and you don't want to show the pop-up all the time let's do an extra variable which is game end and let's check also for that if game end is equal to false that means that the game hasn't ended yet then we can do this and if the spots are zero game end true so that means that whenever we are checking this if we get to the end we show the pop-up and we say that the game has ended let's try it out now oh i will disable these visible collision shapes Okay, now if I move this there, level clear. Okay, problem is that now we can keep playing. And we want to just change level or do anything else. So we can set this signal, which is confirmed. So whenever they press on OK, we can get the tree, which is the node that has all the, the, the scene and everything and we reload the current scene that means that the game will start over level clear okay yeah and it goes back to the beginning let's make now a different level um let's make it like this 
Let's do two spots now to test it. And let's do one box here and the other box there. Let's add some difficulty to it. Something like this. Okay. It's not that hard, but I mean, it's getting a little bit more interesting. Let's try now what happens with two boxes and two spots. First of all, you will notice that if you move the box one to another, you cannot push two boxes at the same time because it detects it as if it was a wall, which is what we want in these kind of games. And now let's see if we move one there. Okay, we still need to fill the other spot. So as soon as we move it, okay, level cleared. That's great. And when you press OK, it resets. So another thing that it's very common in this kind of games, since there's many ways to finish complex levels, is to have a counter of how many steps you have done. That way we can see if you can clear it in less steps than the others. And eventually in a future episode, we're going to make a level editor. And if you share those levels with other people, you can also have like a high score to check if people clear the level in less movements than the others. So let's do that with the label now. Let's add a label. One label is going to be for the name of the level, which is level one. And we want to use this custom font because the default one is very pixelated and blurred. So that's why I added this asset at the beginning. To do that, let's take this one. And here in custom fonts, we can create a new dynamic font. Just going to make sure that I'm not covering the properties with my head here. So font is going to be this one and we need to set now on the settings where is it here here okay if you press on the font anti-alias you need to disable it and size let's make it a bit smaller let's do 12 okay now let's call this name label which is going to be the name of the level and let's duplicate it with control D and let's do this moves zero. So moves label. So every time we make a move with the character, we want to add one to this label. So to do so, let's go to the player script and we want to add it here. Movement plus one and also here, which is also when it moves. But to track it, since we're not sure how many players we have, things like that, let's do it on the game script, which has all the, the, the information we need. Here we can do the moves equals to zero. And here, let's do that. The moves label text is going to be moves equal to plus string of moves. So that way, Every time like we're moving, and we're always checking and we are always updating the kind of the, the amount of moves. So now when we go to the player, we can set get parent, which is gonna be the game node, this node. Let's do that in a very clear way. So game is gonna be get parent. So now game moves plus one and the same for here. So we are updating the variable here and this variable is adding the text. Let's see. Moves 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so if I clear the level, I did it in 37 moves. When we press OK, it goes back to zero. So we know that we are in a new game. Okay. There's one final thing that I would like to add here, and is that when you, whenever you press the letter R, you can reset the game. So you give the players a way out of these kind of situations where they find that they cannot complete it because they made a mistake. It could be any of these mistakes. So it's very simple. In the player events, here in the handle inputs, we need to create an action, 
which is going to be reset. That reset action is a new action that we can set to the key R. And if the event is action pressed reset, the same as we did before, get tree and reload current scene. So whenever we are moving around and you made a mistake, you press R and you go back to the beginning. The next video we cover this, the movement so we can try to make it smoother or you can also do it yourself with the tutorial from Kids Can Code like the one that I talked about at the beginning. And my goal for this series is to add a level editor. So in the next episodes, we're going to see how to create a game editor and how to share those levels with other people. Hope you like it. Thank you very much, everyone, for all your support. And thank you very much for all your support to all my patrons, because it's thanks to you that I can keep doing these videos. So thank you very much.